That song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, is our featured song on the playlist today. And before we look at the scripture that inspired it, allow me to share a little bit about the history of that song as our custom during this series. A Little Town of Bethlehem was written by the Reverend Phillips Brooks, probably the greatest American preacher of the 19th century. Phillips Brooks was a giant teddy bear of a man. He stood 6'4". He was Boston born and Harvard educated. And at the age of 26, yes, just 26, he became the senior pastor of Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in downtown Philadelphia. And in his first year, the church exploded in growth, history tells us. He started with around 33 kids, and by the end of the year, it said in the Sunday school program, kids all over the city came, and they had nearly 1,000 kids in the church. But this was right in the middle of the American Civil War. And let me remind you that the greatest battle of the Civil War took place just 125 miles southwest of Philadelphia at Gettysburg, and several of the men of that church lost their life. And so Phillips tried to pastor the people in the midst of all that grief, and it was very difficult. And then in April 1865, Phillips Brooks, 29 years old, President Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Brooks was not the president's pastor, but when they brought his body to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, because of Phillips Brooks's popularity in the city, they asked him to give the eulogy. And it was so powerful, the eulogy for President Lincoln, that newspapers across the United States printed his sermon and it went viral. And Phillips Brooks became an instant celebrity of that age. But all this took a huge toll upon his life. And so he went to his church board and he asked for sabbatical for one year. And they granted it to him. And at 29 years old, he went to Europe. And then he went to Israel. And it was on Christmas Eve, 1865, he found himself in Jerusalem, where he saddled a horse and rode six miles south in the Judean desert to the little town of Bethlehem. And it was there on Christmas Eve in shepherd's fields, Overlooking the little town of Bethlehem, he was inspired to write the poem that we have the words that Emily sang. He came back to Philadelphia then and gave the words to his music director, Lois Rindner, and he put it to music, and that's how we got the hymn. In 1995, I was in Shepherd's Fields in Bethlehem, and we sang Phillips Brooks' carol. And I'll never forget our guide saying, The key line for Phillips Brooks was this, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. In Kingsburg Church, I want to say the hopes and fears of Miami County are met in Jesus today. Amen? Amen. Amen. This song about a little town so far away has inspired millions And today, we know that big things can come about through small things. So if you have your Bibles today, I want to invite you to turn with me to the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 5. If you have a Bible app, you can open it up to there, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. You can find Micah, God bless you. (laughs) And I want to read a little bit. I want to show you a prophecy that was written about 800 years before Jesus' birth that speaks of the little town of Bethlehem. Hear these words. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me the one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old. From ancient times, 
Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will live securely for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. The key line, I believe, is the second verse where it says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, yet out of you will come for me, the one who will be the ruler over Israel. Small, ordinary, small town Bethlehem became the center of the earth in that moment. I, w- I want to share just a couple little things. I've made this series pretty simple because I'm a simple person. Two things a day, two take-homes today as we look at the little town of Bethlehem. First of all, God's glory is showcased in the ordinary. God's glory is showcased in the ordinary. Bethlehem was not an elite little town. It was not well known. In fact, when Joshua chapter 15 and Nehemiah chapter 11 list the cities of Judah, Bethlehem's not even mentioned. It was a little village about 300 to 500 people at that day. It was not a unique little town or a center of government like Troy, Ohio is, say, it, it didn't have a perfect little square, it has a manger square today, but, but back then it wasn't like you had that great beautiful square you have in Troy and a Christmas tree with all the lights and all those unique little quaint shops and gift shops and restaurants. It wasn't even like Tip City's beautiful Main Street in the evening during this time with all the lights. Think more of just a small, normal little town like maybe West Milton or smaller than that like Laurel or actually Bethlehem was a suburb of Jerusalem. So think of Troutwood to Dayton, just a suburb. It was the center of where bread was baked and supplied for the city of Jerusalem. In Hebrew, the word Bethlehem literally means what? Do you remember what we shared a while back? house of bread. So it was full of millers, it was full of bakers, it was full of a few shepherds, at least one carpenter family, right? That was Bethlehem. And so what it says to me is that God can show up big, even in small, ordinary places that no one's heard about, even a little crossroads like Ginsburg, Ohio. Often we paint this picture perfect picture of Christmas. Everything has to be big and extraordinary in Hollywood and New York. And yet we find it's in small things and it's in the normal everyday life. How many of us have tried to keep up with the Smiths and Joneses and had everything perfect for Christmas? We do all kinds of things. We turn our homes into winter wonderlands, right? We get the perfect Christmas card. How many took a family Christmas picture this year, right? Did it come out perfect? Here's one that I recently saw online. Check this out. Does this sum up your family right here (laughs) this Christmas? I mean, this can be a time of stress and anxiety too. Some of us are just overwhelmed with busyness. Heard about this story of a family had this dog, it wasn't their dog, but this dog kept showing up on their deck in the afternoon to take a nap. You just walk up the stairs and sleep for about two hours and it would go home and it was well fed. They, they weren't feeding the dog or anything, but, but they were noticing this dog would come up about the same time, take a nap for two hours and then leave. Had a collar, but no name. And so they thought, well, at least I wonder if there's someone looking for the dog during this time. So they got creative. They said, we're going to write a note. 
to the owner to let them know. So they wrote this note and he says, we just want you to know that every afternoon, like clockwork, your dog comes over to our deck, takes a nap, and then leaves, and that's where your dog is. Now, we're not upset about it, but if you're looking for your dog, your dog has been with us, and they sign their name. To their surprise, the next day, when the dog came back, the dog had a different note on his collar, and it was from the owner, and it said this. It said, quote, the dog lives in a house with 10 children. He's just trying to catch up on some sleep. And then the owner writes, would you mind if I joined him tomorrow? <laughs> Signed, the mom of the house. <laughs> Isn't that real life in Miami County in 2022, right? Good news, good news, good news. God shines in the ordinary. And if you're just an ordinary person, you know, someone once described Gingsburg as a a church of misfits. Amen. It's an everyday life. God comes and shines when we give God the glory. The second thing I think the little town of Bethlehem says to us is that in our weakness and smallness, God displays his power. So many times we come to church and we pray, God, take away my weakness, take away my my struggle, take away all this and give me strength and give me just power that I may shine for you. But often it's when we humble ourselves. It's when God shows up. You know, we do our best around here with music and, you know, I pray and I try to do my best, but I realize it's not about me. <laughs> it's, you know, people aren't overly concerned with how many lights we have or smoke in the background and, and all that. I mean, that's, that's fine. But actually, when we humble ourselves, that's when God gets the glory. Amen? It, we, we said that Phillips Brooks was a great American pastor, and he was. And he still talked about today, at least through this carol. But did you know that he had a major weakness? He preached too fast. In fact, people recorded him preaching and he would preach 250 words per minute. It was too fast. It was hard at times to follow him. But when the anointing of God came upon him, the Lord used his weakness for his strength. It captured people's attention. They, had, they couldn't fall asleep under him, you know? And therefore, God got the glory. Some of us say, you know, Low is me, I can't do anything. I could never be a messenger. Well, again, it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. And this Christmas, you have a big opportunity to be a messenger of the good news, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do it in many different ways, but this week we can do it by simply inviting people to come and worship our Lord on Christmas Eve. And so I invite you to do that. Studies have shown time and time again that people are open to come, especially if they're coming with a friend, someone they know. Not just say, come to our church, but would you come and sit with me? And I'm talking about family members. I'm talking about adult sons who don't typically go to church. I'm talking about spouses, perhaps, that are not connected right now to the church. But on Christmas Eve, if you give a personal invite to come and to be with you on this special night as a family or a friend, people are open. We want to be uh, a place that makes that very easy for you, as Dan had mentioned. In fact, we have a QR code even right now. If you want to, you can take out your phone. And if you know how to do that, just scan that right now. And that will take you to our page. It has a video of, of me inviting. You can share that in your social networks, or there are other ways that, that you can invite people. Pray, pray, pray that God will speak to you and to your loved ones this Christmas Eve. Pray for me. Pray for the team. Pray for the person that you are inviting to come. Let's not be a church of 2,000 people who just show up and receive. Let's be a 
church of 2,000 greeters, all right? Let's not just receive the light. Let's give the light. Let's share the light. Uh, A person a while back came up to me. They were so excited, and they said, Pastor Dennis, Pastor, I've been praying for a long time, and my friend finally showed up for church. Yeah, they're over by the coffee shop. I'm so excited. And I said, I'm excited for you today. And they said, yeah, don't screw it up. (laughs) Well, we'll do our very best as you pray and we'll pray together, but you can be a messenger because God works in weakness. The little town of Bethlehem reminds us that God chose to enter the world as a helpless baby. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1. Then John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God wrapped himself in the robes of humanity and moved into our neighborhood. I love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands. You say, nobody understands what I'm going through. Yes, Jesus does. Jesus felt pain. Jesus was tired. Jesus was tempted. Jesus knows what we're going through because he came and dwelt among us and lived among us that we might be able to go to him. I love that whole concept of identity. Let me tell you one more story today. Lawrence Wilkes was my doctoral mentor 20 years ago. Lawrence was, uh, for many years, over a dozen years, the Sunday evening preacher at the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California. And I connected to him back in 1998. We became friends. It was through United Theological Seminary. And then I made 12 trips, 13 trips out to Los Angeles during that time. And he then in Schuller's transition, he became the interim pastor for a while. I actually had him come and speak in Piqua years ago. But in his book entitled, He Walks Among Us, He tells this story that I just love. I want to share it with you. I know I'm going to read it to you, but you just listen to sound my voice. I think you'll enjoy it. He said, I walked into a pet store. This was in Los Angeles. And the first thing I noticed were the puppies. Oh, I love those little cute, happy creatures. They were pressing their noses against the glass and saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. And there was this one Dalmatian dog. He was bigger than all the others. And I wondered why he was bigger and plus why he was on sale for half price. As I was standing near the puppies, another customer came along. The lady was a bit bolder inquiring than me. She said, why is this dog half price? Oh, said the sales clerk. He's deaf. He's totally deaf. Can't hear a thing. Once that was found out, we had no choice but to reduce the price, and of course, nobody wants him. That's why he's half the price and why he is bigger than the other puppies. This weekend, the breeders will be coming to take him back because no one wants to buy a deaf dog. Oh, says the lady, what a shame, what a beautiful dog. Then the lady inquired, what will happen to this little dog? Well, the clerk said, I can only guess they're not going to use him for breeding, and they're not going to have him hanging around. I can tell you that. Once I heard all this, my heart began to ache. What a beautiful little dog. He doesn't know there's something wrong with him. He was born that way. He looked happy as he could, standing there wondering, why doesn't someone pick me? I'm a happy dog. I'm a great guy. (laughs) Realizing that dog was deaf, no one wanted him, even a half price, He was condemned to death for being himself. Lawrence writes this, I hope this doesn't offend you for praying for dogs, but I do love them so much and I feel like God has a responsibility here too because he created them. So I started to pray mentally. I said, Lord, this little dog is going to be put to death in a few days if someone doesn't buy him. I can't buy him. We've already got a dog. Oh, Jesus, is there any way that somehow this little dog could find a home? Just at that point, I turned around and in through the door came a couple wheeling a stroller with a little boy in it. 
They neared the puppies. The deaf dog went straight to the little lad and put his paws, can you picture this? Put his paws up to the little boy's knees and stretched out his nose to the little boy's face. The little boy stretched out his arms and hugged the pup. They bonded immediately. The mother, looking at the dog with her son, said to the sales clerk, he's half price and he's bigger, why? The clerk went through the same routine. I was standing back pretending I was looking at something else. My heart was aching. I wanted to cry but held back the tears. I mustered up all the strength I could and stood there pretending to look at other things while listening. What happened next still brings tears to my eyes. As they were talking to the clerk, the young mother turned to her husband and said, honey, do you think we could have this dog? He's deaf and so is our son. Maybe they could help each other. The mother had tears in her eyes and of course I did too. And he said this, I left that store and the last thing I saw was that young family charging the little deaf dog to their credit card and preparing to take him home. At Christmas, we see in Bethlehem, God comes to us with his defenses down so we can come to him on bended knee with our defenses down. As I said a few weeks ago, God comes to us crawling on his hands and knees as a baby so we can go to him. Phillips Brooks ends this beautiful, beloved Christmas carol with a powerful prayer. Did you catch it? It's the last verse. And now that you know it's a prayer, anytime you ever sing this in the future, your heart will go right to it. It's the last verse that we're gonna sing. I've asked Emily to come and sing. But the words go like this. Here's the prayer. And it can be your prayer today. It's a prayer of salvation. It's a prayer of new birth. It's a prayer of new life and hope. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. God can be born anew in your heart today. For little things become big, even in the town of Bethlehem.